the hidden history of Christmas, Bible and pagans. We are looking at the history of Christmas and its pagan origins, and how this all connects to the biblical story of Jesus' birth. How could this even be possible? Although Christmas may look like a pure Christian holiday, just recently it was not so. In fact, it was just the opposite. We will seek to uncover the true depths of how influential pagan cultures is still influencing the world. And we will uncover to you all the surprising truths that we found. To understand the roots of Christmas, we need to travel back in time, long before the birth of Christ. Imagine ancient Europe. Cold, dark, and harsh winters ruled the land. Life wasn't easy, and every year, people faced a daunting challenge, making it through the season of scarcity. But amidst the struggle, there was hope. Hope that the sun, their source of life and warmth, would return stronger. This hope gave birth to traditions we still see today. In the northern regions, the celebration of Yule marked the winter solstice. On the darkest night of the year, they lit massive bonfires to honor the sun and keep its memory alive. Families brought home enormous logs, the famous Yule logs, and kept them burning as a symbol of light overcoming darkness. Sound familiar? That's the origin of the Yule log tradition we hear about today. Meanwhile, in southern Europe, the Romans celebrated their own midwinter festival, Saturnalia. This was a grand event dedicated to Saturn, the god of agriculture. It marked the end of the harvest and the beginning of winter rest. But Saturnalia was no quiet religious observance. It was a full-blown carnival. During Saturnalia, social norms were flipped upside down. Masters and slaves traded places, and the streets were filled with laughter, singing, and celebration. Homes were decorated with greenery. People feasted until they couldn't eat another bite. And yes, they even gave gifts, just like we do today. Many of the decorations we associate with Christmas, holly, mistletoe, and wreaths, come from these ancient traditions. They symbolized life and fertility during the bleakest time of year. But there's more to the story. In both the Northern Yule and the Roman Saturnalia, these festivals weren't just about survival. They were about letting loose, breaking free from the rules of daily life. And sometimes, this freedom went too far. These celebrations could get wild. It was a time to indulge in food, drink, and, well, other behaviors that wouldn't be considered appropriate the rest of the year. Some of this still survives today. Ever heard of kissing under the mistletoe? That's an echo of these ancient fertility customs. As Christianity spread, these celebrations didn't disappear. Instead, they were transformed. The church had a choice. Reject these beloved traditions or give them a new meaning. What happened next would change the course of history and the way we celebrate Christmas forever. The decorations we use today also have roots in these pagan festivals. Evergreens like holly and mistletoe were symbols of life and fertility. Mistletoe especially carried a sacred meaning. It was believed to have magical properties, bringing health, protection, and blessings. Over time, it became a symbol of love and romance. So the next time you see mistletoe at a holiday party, remember, it's more than just a fun excuse to steal a kiss. It's a tradition that goes all the way back to these ancient festivals, where fertility and renewal were at the heart of the celebration. Then there was the feasting. People ate and drank more than they would all year. Imagine a table overflowing with roasted meats, freshly baked bread, and mugs of spiced wine. This was the ultimate indulgence. A time to eat, drink, and be merry without worrying about tomorrow. Sound familiar? Today, 
we carry on this tradition with Christmas feasts. The turkey, the desserts, and even the over-the-top portions all harken back to these ancient festivals. But in those days, it wasn't just about joy. It was about survival. People needed to believe that abundance was possible, even in the darkest of times. Unfortunately, with all this indulgence came excess. The rules of daily life were gone, and people let their impulses take over. Gambling was common, drinking was excessive, and self-control was forgotten. These festivals often turned into what we might call today a free-for-all. And yes, some of this still survives. Think of holiday office parties where people drink too much, or the push to buy, spend, and indulge during the Christmas season. These echoes of Yule and Saturnalia are all around us, even if we don't realize it. One particularly wild tradition was the election of a Lord of Misrule. This person was in charge of the chaos, encouraging everyone to let go of their inhibitions. For 12 days, the duration of these festivals, the Lord of Misrule could do as he pleased. This idea of a topsy-turvy world is the root of the 12 days of Christmas. But for early Christians, these wild festivals were a serious problem. How could they celebrate Christ while people around them indulged in such pagan customs? They had a choice, reject these traditions or find a way to redeem them. What happened next would forever change. In the early centuries, most Christians refused to celebrate these festivals. They saw them as pagan, indulgent, and completely opposed to the teachings of Christ. After all, how could a celebration filled with drunkenness, gambling, and wild behavior possibly honor God? Take, for example, the story of Pope Gregory in the fourth century. He sent a missionary named Augustine. Augustine was tasked with converting the local people to Christianity. But when he arrived, he quickly realized the challenge ahead of him. The people were deeply attached to their midwinter festivals, and no amount of preaching could convince them to give them up. In his letter, Augustine explained that these festivals were too important to the people. No matter how much he preached, they wouldn't stop celebrating. He asked Pope Gregory for advice. Should he keep trying to persuade them to abandon these traditions? Or was there another way? Pope Gregory's response was both strategic and controversial. He essentially said, if you can't beat them, join them. Rather than trying to stop these festivals, Gregory suggested transforming them. Instead of celebrating the rebirth of the sun, the people could celebrate the birth of the Son of God. And so, December 25th was chosen as the official date to celebrate Jesus' birth. The reasoning was simple. It was close to the winter solstice, when the pagan festivals were already in full swing. By giving people a Christian reason to celebrate, the Church hoped to gradually replace the old traditions with new ones focused on Christ. But there's one question that often comes up. Was Jesus actually born on December 25th? The Bible gives us clues that suggest otherwise. For example, the Gospel of Luke tells us that shepherds were out in the fields watching their flocks at night. In Israel, this would have been unlikely in December. It was too cold, and there was often snow on the hills. Most people agree that Jesus was likely born in the spring or fall, when the weather was mild and shepherds could stay out in the fields. So why December 25th? The date wasn't chosen because it was historically accurate. It was chosen because it fit the church's mission to reach the people where they were. This decision was practical, but it wasn't without controversy. Some early Christians believed it was wrong to mix pagan traditions with the worship of Christ. They feared it would dilute the true message of the gospel. And even today, some Christians feel uneasy about the pagan roots of Christmas. But for the church leaders of the time, the goal was clear. Bring people closer to Christ. By assigning a Christian meaning to these celebrations, 
they hoped to gradually shift the focus away from indulgence and toward worship. This blending of traditions wasn't immediate. It took centuries. At first, many of the old customs continued. The Yule Log, the Evergreens, and even the feasting remained part of the celebrations. But slowly, these symbols were given new meanings. The Yule Log came to represent Christ as the light of the world. Evergreens symbolized eternal life through Jesus, and the twelve days of feasting became associated with the journey of the Magi. The Church also introduced new traditions to focus on Christ. The Nativity scene, for example, became a way to teach people about Jesus' humble birth. Hymns and carols were written to replace pagan songs. Over time, these new customs began to take root, and the old pagan meanings faded into the background. But the process wasn't always smooth. For centuries, Christmas remained a mix of pagan and Christian elements. Some people fully embraced the Christian meaning while others continued to hold on to the old ways. This tension between the sacred and the secular is something we still see today. So what does all this mean for us? Can we celebrate Christmas with its pagan roots? And how can we honor the true meaning of Christ's birth in a season so full of distractions? To answer these questions, we need to take a closer look at the journey of Christmas through the centuries and how it became the holiday we know today. In the 4th century, Pope Julius officially declared December 25th as the date for Christ's birth. This wasn't based on biblical evidence, but on a clever calculation. By aligning the celebration of Christ's birth with the already popular winter festivals, the Church could introduce a Christian narrative without demanding people abandon their cherished traditions all at once. But the date carried more meaning than just convenience. December 25th was also linked to the Roman festival of Sol Invictus, the unconquered sun, which celebrated the return of longer days after the winter solstice. For Christians, this symbolism wasn't lost. They reinterpreted it as a celebration of the Son of God, the true light of the world. Over time, December 25th became more than just a date. It became a powerful symbol. In choosing this day, the Church sent a message. Christ's birth represents the light that overcomes darkness, the hope that dispels despair. It was a perfect parallel to the solstice festivals people already celebrated. But the decision to merge these traditions didn't come without conflict. Not everyone agreed with this approach. Some devout Christians believed it was wrong to incorporate pagan elements into the worship of Christ. They argued that the focus should remain solely on biblical teachings, untainted by worldly influences. Throughout history, there were those who rejected Christmas altogether. For example, certain Christian groups in the Middle Ages avoided the celebration, seeing it as too closely tied to pagan customs. Even centuries later, during the Reformation, the Puritans in England and America tried to ban Christmas entirely. To the Puritans, Christmas was nothing more than an excuse for indulgence, drinking, and debauchery. They viewed it as a distraction from the true purpose of faith. For them, the idea of celebrating Christ's birth on December 25th, a date with pagan origins, was unacceptable. This debate over what's sacred and what's secular continues even today. How much of Christmas is about Christ? How much of it is cultural? These questions aren't new. They've been asked for centuries. But despite the debates, the Church's choice of December 25th had a lasting impact. By assigning this day to Christ's birth, they planted a seed, a new narrative that would grow and evolve over time. It allowed the focus to shift from pagan gods to the God who, according to Christian belief, became flesh and dwelled among us.